Thanks, Kyle. Um, you know, we were just talking, and uh, we've got, I think, more board members from Midland than anywhere in the country. <laughs> so we have a, I have a special place in my heart for Midland. Uh, I know, I think here we've got Kyle and uh, Dennis, and I don't think any, any of the other guys are here. They're out of town, but uh, I, Midland's a special place. Has been uh, right at the beginning of our organization for me. We were a state group originally, and then went national. And again, as Kyle mentioned, First Liberty is the largest legal organization in the country that all we do is religious freedom. So let's say you're uh, Gabriela Perez, you're a uh, five-year-old girl, and you're caught praying over your meal in the lunch cafeteria, told uh, it's not good to pray at school. And then uh, you go home and tell your parents, and you're a poor family, I mean, what are you supposed to do? You don't have $100,000 to go you know, retain a legal firm or something. So. We come in, we bring the best litigators in the country, they donate their time, so that when we win for Gabriella, which we did, uh, we don't just win for Gabriella, we set a precedent that protects all of our kids and our grandkids. And so that's why we do what we do. Um, I'm gonna do something a little different today because I know when I looked at the purpose of, of uh, the ministry here, I'm gonna give you a report of kind of what's happening in the battle and religious freedom across our country. But I know also one of the things that the person usually does is kind of talk about you know what they've learned, what God's, how God got them into this thing, and 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 what they've learned, and sort of how to run their business or lead their business or be a good person at, at where they're working. So I want to talk about both of those a little bit. Uh, and so that starts with my story. Um, you know, I grew up, I uh, lost my dad when I was two, so uh, really had a mom who, and in fact, uh, the business that they had was a gas station and sort of a an oil middleman. Uh, and so my, you know. Blonde, you know, cute uh, mom uh, was all of a sudden in a pretty rough man's business, uh, but she turned out to be pretty rough herself. And so she stood her ground, she raised her son, and got me into the best school she could get into. And it's just, but I really have always felt like God was a, you know, it's, scripture's real clear God's a father of the fatherless. So if you know people who are in a situation, maybe you worry about somebody who's got a single mom situation or, or any situation is tough. Just, I think it's a lesson. My life is a lesson that, you know, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You know, God's a father to the fatherless, to the orphans, to the widows. And God can just pick right in. And he's really, I had a lot of people in my life say, you know, God's really kind of been your father. Kind of protected, walked with me, etc. And so, uh, and the other thing I'd say is a theme through what I'm going to talk about is, you know, we talk about leadership. You go, we all go to leadership things and read books and all that. Um, you know, I, I just think life is so complicated and people are so complicated that I, the one thing that I think is, because I think a lot of that stuff might be good principles, but I think ultimately to me leadership is listening to God. Uh, because I'm not smart enough to know what to do next in most situations. I can't see the future. I don't know whether that new venture is going to be blow up in my face or going to be the greatest thing you've ever done, right? But God does. And uh, so if I'll just listen, and I think we miss and we, we, we don't see what God's doing a lot of times and we miss out. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try to give a couple examples of that. But my start is when I was a senior in high school, I knew my gifts were in analytical thinking and speaking. And so I thought I either need to be a pastor or a lawyer. And people said, well, that's like a God or Satan choice, isn't it, to be a pastor? <laughs> and I looked at my DNA, and I thought I'd probably do better at dispensing justice rather than mercy, and so I'd probably make a better lawyer. Um, and I went to law school, um, and I was at Baylor. And if you looked at my intelligence score, I should have been an average law student. I mean, average intelligence compared to the other law students. But my heart was really, you can turn that off if that's mine, um, but my, my heart was really for ministry. And so here I was at law school, and I ended up leading the discipleship ministry for uh, the college students at my church. Well, this is a really bad plan. Be an average intelligence law student. Everybody else is studying 24-7, and you're doing this ministry thing in addition, right? But, you know, when the grades came back, I was making all the high grades. And it was just God's way to show me, do law, but keep your heart for ministry. So I got out, I clerked for a federal judge. Uh, you do that for one year, typically. You research, write opinions, help the judge behind the scenes. It's really unique because you get to see what it's like to be on the other side of the bench. So all the big law firms want you to come work for them because very few people have that perspective. 
And uh, so I had all those offers, and I just thought, you know, I feel like I'd suffocate if I went and was the regular lawyer. I just don't feel like that's what God's calling me to do. And I remember sitting in my little clerk's office thinking, well, what do you want to do? I thought, well, I want to use my legal skills because God's shown me he wants me to do that, but I want to help pastors and churches and religious freedoms and our founding principles, and I'd even like to go to seminary part-time. And I laughed because there was, there was no job that paid you money to do this thing in the United States. Two weeks later, two big partners in big national law firms, never met these guys in my life, called me out of the blue and said, will you go to lunch? I said, sure. And they said, look, we started donating our time for religious freedom. We're getting so many calls now, it's hurting our ability to make a living. So we were wondering, would you be willing to come on, do legal cases, help pastors, churches, religious freedoms, and our founding principles, and you can even go to seminary part-time if you want to. Uh, being maybe a little immature in my faith, a little young, I said, let me pray about it. Like, that wasn't an answer to prayer. And uh, the next day I said yes, and they said how much you need to live on. I was making 28000 as a federal clerk, and these guys pitched in and out of their pocket, and we started a nonprofit. And that was 32 years ago. And now First Liberty is the largest legal nonprofit in the country. All we do is religious freedom. So it's just a matter of listening to God and going places. You know, that was my passion. That was kind of how he built me, but I didn't see anything. But if you listen to God, he'll take you where he needs to take you to. Um, why is, I want to start out with some basics. Why is this important? Why is religious freedom important? Um, most non-Christians don't get it. It's really important to them. It's our first freedom because if you lose it, you'll lose all your freedom. But most Christians, I found out, most people of faith don't even understand why it's really important. They tend to think, well, I want my religious freedom. It's much bigger than that. Um, there's, I mean, and we're st I think most people are starting to get a glimpse of that. Um, there's a, 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 a great book, if you haven't read it, that's out right now called uh, Live Not By Lies by uh, Rod Dreher. He goes and he interviews people from former communist countries, Czechoslovakia, um, the former Soviet Union, Hungary, Poland, etc. And to a one, all these people are terrified at what they're seeing in the United States, because uh, it's exactly what they saw. And um, the question, and one of the things you see in that is that when the Marxism begins to come in, the first thing that has to be done is you have to remove the church. You have to, they, you know, they come into Poland, the first thing they do is kill the priests. Okay, because this is a competing philosophy or structure with religion. So you have to remove religious freedom. And, uh, and so the, the question in that, okay, what do you do about this kind of stuff, right? When it comes in or when it's taken over, how do you defeat it? Um, and the answer is live not by lies, which is uh, the last essay that Solzhenitsyn wrote before he was banned from Russia uh, or Soviet Union was live not by lies. And that was... These, all these totalitarian regimes exist on lies, and everybody has to go along with the lies. But if enough people, not a majority, just enough people stand and speak the truth, it collapses the system. It can't handle it, because everybody realizes the emperor has no clothes when people speak the truth. And I mean, that's really the battle. I, you, I, I hope you recognize that that's where we are right now, right? I mean, think of how many things. Do you think most Americans are confused about what a male and a female is? You know, 95% of the country know that. How many people are willing to say it? And so this is the issue is, are we going to live by lies, or are people going to speak the truth? In love, but speak the truth. And, uh, and so it's a great book, I think, at reminding people, and that's why people are beginning to see that Religious freedom is sort of at the center of all of our freedoms. And the best way I can describe this is the one thing that a totalitarian regime will never allow is citizens who hold an allegiance to one higher than the government. So whenever that type of oppression comes in, the first flashpoint is always going to be religious freedom. And if you lose there, you'll lose all your freedoms, your economic freedoms, all your freedoms. And the founders got this. That's why they called it our first freedom. And so how are we doing if this is the big issue? Well, I mean, I probably don't have to convince you. We're in a war right now over religious freedom. We had, I think, 12 years ago, we had 48 cases. Last year, we had 321. Uh, and the types of cases are things you would never even imagine now, right? Things that you're having to fight over. So um, I don't have to go very far with this. Just look at COVID, right? We had uh, all of a sudden, all these mayors and governors get power that they'd never had before. What was the flashpoint? It was closing down all the churches and the synagogues and 
That, those are the big legal battles, right? And, uh, and so it's exactly what we talked about. Well, we knew going into this how hard this was going to be because we knew that you're going to go into court and you're going you're gonna to actually be telling a, a judge, hey, I know the governor says that you know, he's trying to save millions of lives, but we want you to open this church on Sunday for an hour. Well, a few judges are going to want to rule that way. I mean, they're going to be, gosh, I could be risking a lot of people. So we knew there was no precedent. There was, there was nothing out there on this, and we knew we had to be very careful. So we prayed, and we waited. And we had hundreds and hundreds of churches, synagogues calling us saying, and you saw the stuff going on. Yeah, the gambling parlor can be open, the liquor store can be open, but you can't be open for an hour on Sunday in a safe way. I mean, it was nonsense, okay? It was totally irrational, uh, clearly discriminatory and unconstitutional, but you had to be, you had to be careful. And so right about a year and a half ago, right before Easter, we had a call from a church. And they said, look, we, we wanted to have a way that we could have Easter and be together. But we didn't want to endanger anybody. So we came up with this idea of driving into the parking lot in our cars. The minister would speak over a radio frequency into the cars. And I'm no CDC expert. Of course, I don't know that the CDC is an expert these days either. But you don't pass the coronavirus from one automobile to another, okay? So uh, it was pretty safe. And they said this was gonna be a crime. They were gonna criminally prosecute everybody for driving in their car to the church parking lot. And we're like, wow. And then the governor said on Easter Sunday, they were gonna send police officers to every church and any church that had churches in, uh, cars in the parking lot, they were gonna look at their license plate and they were going to be visited at their home by police and quarantined for 14 days. We said, okay, we're now in China. This is the case, right? And so we filed uh, an emergency uh, injunction called a TRO on Good Friday. Uh, we got an excellent uh, federal judge. And uh, it was really, we call it the shot heard around the world. Because every, if you'll remember right now, at this point, everybody, the visuals they're seeing on TV is, you know, a father throwing a baseball with his son being handcuffed because he was in the park. Um, a guy coming off the, with a surfboard when there's nobody on the beach being arrested. Um, I mean, people were wondering, has the Constitution been suspended? And this was the first question, the test case. And the judge said, this is outrageous. Never in my life did I think that I would ever see an American city criminalize an Easter gap. He said, this is unconstitutional, it's irrational, and it goes against everything this country is about. And he issued a strong injunction, 20-page opinion about how this country is built on religious freedom and really set the mark in place that we are still in a constitutional system. You can't do whatever you want to do. Uh, the idea that you could go to Walmart with thousands of people, and that's fine, but it's not safe by the church, uh, you know, when you're being safe and socially distanced, it, 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 there's no rationale for that. Um, so, but our goal wasn't to get people in their cars to the church parking lot. So our next case was a case called the Tabernacle Baptist Church. This is a church in a rural area with very few COVID cases, had a big facility, just wanted to do it safe, and it was a crime. So we filed a lawsuit, and by the end of the lawsuit, we had not only won an injunction on behalf of this church, but uh, Daniel Cameron, the African-American um, uh, attorney general for the state of Kentucky, who's a great guy. He joined us, and by the end of the case, he sued his own governor. Gotta like that. Um, and by the end of the case, we ended up with a statewide injunction in joining and protecting the right of every church across the state and synagogue to open in a safe way. And so we, we really began to open back up for religious freedom. But we're still in a battle over this. Uh, we've won a bunch of these cases, including D.C., all over the country. But the Supreme Court hasn't never took one of these. They did emergency motions. So really there's no merits decisions out there right now at the Supreme Court on whether the government controls our churches. So it's still a battle. Um, but we have tons of other kinds of cases. Um, uh, attacks on churches all the time. Like we just finished a case, this is Canaan Baptist Church, uh, where the city came and said, well, we're gonna take your property. And they said, we can't, that's, we're gonna do our worship center on that property. It's a small African-American church. And they said, uh, you know, we're going to take it. So what do you want our property for? Well, we're going to build a fire station there. There's a fire station across the street. 
It's like, yeah, but we like we think you like that better. Well, they just figured they they don't have any power, any money. They, what could they do? Well, we brought in top litigators in the country, and by the end, they're putting up their worship center there. Uh, the city decided that they didn't need their land so much uh, after some litigation. And uh, my favorite part is uh, the uh, church just contacted us, and they're naming the new sanctuary after the lead attorney on the case. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a good turnaround. But we're having to defend just the right of the church to build their sanctuary, to have their church. we got synagogue cases all over the country where there are attacks on synagogues. Um, just crazy stuff, you know, you wouldn't think you'd have to fight this, but you do right now in the United States. Um, attacks in schools. Uh, I give you a lot of examples, but I take Elizabeth Turner, valedictorian, uh, up in uh, Michigan, and she gets, you know, valedictorian means, uh, valedictory address means personal farewell. And people give their opinions in those. A lot of political stuff is said often, right? Well, they reviewed her speech, though, and said, but there's some inappropriate things that you can't say. Well, like what? Like God and Jesus. You've got God and Jesus. That's inappropriate. You can't say that. The government can't tell a citizen, well, you, you can speak, but you can't say anything about your faith, right? It's clearly unconstitutional. So by the time we were done, Elizabeth not only gave her valedictory address in front of her audience, but it was carried nationally all across the country on Fox and other people. So she just reached more people than she was expecting to reach. And other kids saw this, and they, they were being restricted too, and they called us, and so we, it led to more of this. But I mean, these kind of things are happening across the schools, across the country. Attacks on, uh, well, the woke corporations attacking people, right? I mean, you got these... The new religion of people who really don't have religion is in these woke corporations where it's like you have to do this thing that, that we want you to do, virtual signaling, or we're going to punish you. Uh, the problem with a lot of this stuff is there wasn't a way to get after what they were doing to people. Uh, we, we have a new case that is, I think, going to be a great way to get after. It's the first sort of response to this woke corporate abuse of, of citizens of the United States. And I think we've got a short video we can show you. It's uh, Alaska Airlines and uh, some flight attendants we're representing. Lacey Smith loved being a flight attendant. The job was a perfect fit for her personality and her faith. I mean, there's, of course, adventure that's a part of it. There were so many places that I got to explore that I wouldn't have otherwise. And in the same way, that's the same thing with the people, right? You just have so many different people. And so just kind of being there and serving in a way, when you think of, you know, Jesus and the servant leadership, just being able to serve in a way that just met their need where they were at. She worked for Alaska Airlines, a woke corporation, so she was not surprised when a notice appeared on an employee-only page. So it just caught my eye because they had just posted it, and the title was, Alaska Supports the Equality Act. H.R. 5, the Equality Act. That is a deceptively named bill in Congress. The large print may trumpet equality, but the fine print destroys important legal protections for people of faith. What we're seeing now in the name of equality for people is um, equality for some, right? That it's believe what I want you to believe or you're canceled. So she posted a comment. As a company, do you think it's possible to regulate morality? And that's all she wrote, but there was a great deal of thought behind it. In terms of regulating morality, laws are all about regulation. That's what they do, they regulate behavior. Um, morality, when you break it down, is just what is right, right? What is wrong, the idea behind that. As Christian, as Christian, my morality comes from God. She says first the airline wrote a response to her comment. Then they deleted it. Then they paused her work schedule. Then they called her in for a meeting. Then they fired her. They said that by my asking the question, I was such a bad person that it merited firing me from my job. And I think that that's the hard part about it. That, you know, like, what do people get fired for, right? Like, they get fired for being, you know, not caring, incompetent, lazy, whatever. It might have nothing to do with performance. It had everything to do with my character. And that's what they fired me for. That they said my character was so bad that I shouldn't work there anymore. And the ultimate irony, what Alaska Airlines did perfectly illustrates why Lacey had questions about the so-called Equality Act. I have the freedom to be who I want, and less apparently I work for Alaska Airlines. And then all of a sudden I no longer have the freedom to be who I am, because in order to keep my job, I now have to agree with everything that the company is saying and doing. When we are determined about things, and when we make up our mind about something, when we know that we know that we know, that allows us that courage. 
So uh, Lace is just one of the people. Uh, but, and can you imagine, you send out something to all your employees and say, we're, we're backing this really extreme bill and uh, we want you to get behind it. So, but we'd love your feedback or any questions you have. And then you ask a question and they fire you. So you can ask a question or make a comment, but if you do so from a Christian perspective, you're fired. Well, you know, the problem they're gonna have with this is there's a federal law against that, okay? It's Title VII. You, not only can you not discriminate against people because of their religion in the workplace, but you have to affirmably accommodate people's religion. So we feel like this is going to be a great example, really the first opportunity to do something about the way a lot of these woke corporations are abusing people's freedoms. And this one is right in the federal law, and uh, we plan to win this case. In fact, the former head lawyer for the EEOC uh, just joined our team because when she saw the facts, she said, I want to be involved in this. Um, so we, we plan to win not only for Lacey and, uh, and the others that we're representing, but really for the whole country and maybe stopping some of this foolishness that's going on. Uh, last thing is we tax in the military. We've got a whole division that just protects people uh, and their religious freedom in the military. We've had tons of cases, lots of chaplains, lots of different things. Probably the most well-known right now is a, a Shields of Strength case. Uh, this, uh, Kenny Vaughn came up with this idea of uh, having these uh, dog tags with a scripture verse in the back because people in the military get scared. There are times that are really fearful. To be able to look down and to see like Joshua 1.8 that says, be strong and courageous, says the Lord. I'm with you. Uh, is really important. And you really can't go anywhere in the military, any, any unit, any branch, without finding people who have these. Uh, well, why are we talking about this? Because about three months ago, we had a letter uh, from the administration saying that they were not going to allow uh, soldiers, airmen, et cetera, to wear these things. Well, well, why not? We don't have to guess. They said it's because it has something religious on it. So they can wear any profanity, any kind of stuff they want. The one thing they're not allowed to wear around their own neck, their choice, is a scripture verse. Uh, well, needless to say, that's not constitutional, and we're going to make sure we do everything we can to, and we're not going to stop till it's over, and everybody in the military has a right to have one if they want one around their neck. But that's probably the most well known. So like some of you are like, hey, boy, Cal, thanks for inviting a depressing speaker where we could hear about these horrible cases. Uh, <laughs> let, let me tell you the good news. The good news is we have a method of dealing with this, and we've been doing it for a long time, and it works. And that is if you were to look at normal nonprofit groups, I don't care if they're left wing or right wing or what their issue is, they have the same model. Raise as much money as you can raise. Use that money to hire as many attorneys as you can. Put them in an office in D.C. or L.A. or New York. Fly them around and cover as many cases of your issue as you can cover. That's the model. That's not our model. Our model is there's all these people who went to law school because they're people of faith and they wanted to stand for what was right. And they wanted to kind of ride in with a saber and the white horse and save the day, right? 30 years later, these are now the best litigators at the best law firms in the country. And they've done honorable work for their clients, but they've never gotten to do a case for their faith or their country. So we sit down with the best of the best and we say, look, if we give you everything you need, are you willing to give your time? on one of these cases. They're like, man, I've been waiting my whole life, sign me up. So we know what's gonna happen when we give them that first case. For the first time in their life, all their talent, all their gifts, all their training, everything they've ever learned is lined up with their faith and their love for their country. Never felt that before. It's kind of unfair, but we know we now have them for the rest of their lives as one of the <laughs> And they give cover to the younger attorneys who are now allowed to work on these cases. And they get to taste of what it's like. So if you were to go through the top 100 law firms in the United States, you'd find that they didn't just do our cases and donate their time. You'd find them fighting with each other over who gets to donate their time. <laughs> cases. And the result of this is twofold. My first goal was I thought we can get a lot more bang for our buck. And sure enough, uh, average case, every 10,000 we spend, we get 60,000 donated. So it's like a six to one leveraging of resources. And we have these incredible litigators who live in this area, who know the judges, who know the practice, and they team up with the people on our staff who are like top of their class from Harvard and all these places, who all they focus on is religious liberty, and you marry that together and you have these incredible teams. So it's great as leveraging. But what I didn't count on was the win-loss ratio, and that is if you were to watch all these legal nonprofits, they're all fighting sort of large giants. They're fighting industry, 
they're fighting government, they're, they're fighting something big. And so their win rate, if they're really good, is maybe 40%. Our win rate now, 22 years in a row, every single year has been above 90% in our cases. And that's because, it's because of God's favor, but it's, it's because of this is his model. You know, we, we have the largest law firm in the United States. It's called the Body of Christ. We can go anywhere in the country and put together a team that you could only dream of in a short amount of time and go into court. And so, you know, if we have a case in Idaho, our attorney is from the best law firm in Idaho. And when they walk into court and look at the judge, they lost a tooth together in first grade. So when the ACLU guy flies in from, you know, L.A. or New York or somewhere, they're playing an away game. And, uh, and so we should win these cases, right? We've got the best litigators. They live in these communities. Um, the law is on our side with regard to religious freedom, so we should. So normally that's where I would stop. I'd say we've got a great model. We'll win the cases. Uh, we've got a case you know, right now at the Supreme Court that we'll be arguing uh, December 8th that I feel highly confident that we're going to have another victory pretty soon. So it's going really well. But something started to change uh, a few years ago that changed what I would talk about. And that is, I began to think, you know, we might be able to change the future. And I changed that about two years ago because now the reality is we are changing the future. Well, what do I mean? Um, really, this kind of goes back to this other point I was talking about, about listening. Um, you know, back when we were, we were a state group originally in Texas. And um, we went national. Our board said, you know, we're winning all these cases and there's a need all around the country and people are begging us to come to other places and do it. It's needed and nobody's doing what we're doing. So we, we went national. Well, the first thing that I had to do is they said, I said, how do I grow a national fundraising organization? Because I, I mean, I've just been in Texas. And so our consultant said to me, well, you need to have a couple of people representing you around the country because you can't go everywhere. I said, okay, what am I looking Who am I looking for? said, somebody with the heart of a pastor and the courage of a used car salesman. And I said, you know, I know some people like that. And uh, so I started thinking, I had three guys I was talking to. And uh, at the last second, they all fell through for really good reason. They all fell through. So I'm on a plane. I'm on my way to Houston. And, you know, on a plane, when you got your eyes closed, people don't know if you're praying or sleeping. Well, I'm praying. And I'm saying, God, I'm just trying to execute this plan that you've laid out for us to do. I said, if I'm missing something... You know, let me know, but I don't understand why you gave me these three guys and then pulled them back at the last second. So if there's something I need to know, just let me know. I kid you not, the second I opened my eyes, the guy to my left across the aisle on the plane who I'd never met in my life taps me on the shoulder, and I turn and look at this guy, and he says, God wants you to know he's bringing you the people you need. And I'm just sitting there kind of, I don't know, drooling, stunned, because I have no idea. I'm just amazed. And he said, are you going, undergoing some sort of growth or reorganization plan? And I looked at him and I said, yeah. And he said, well, God wants you to know it's going to be really hectic. It's going to come together. It's going to work well. And then you're going to have a short time of rest. I was so stunned I couldn't even talk to this guy the rest of the flight. I've never, I don't know who it was. My wife's convinced it was an angel. But uh, the point is God was trying to tell me, this is what I want you to do. Okay, just move ahead. Stop worrying and go. Um, and so we've always done the cases, but four and a half years ago, we, we don't, we're nonpartisan, so we don't care who's in control. We're going to advocate for religious freedom. Well, we were preparing for a Hillary Clinton presidency, and we were going to advocate for religious freedom. And this Donald Trump guy gets elected, and we're like, we got to reevaluate. What, what's, we got to do, redo our plans on how we're going to push religious freedom. We immediately saw 132 judicial seats open. And we were like, you know, that would have the greatest impact on all of the cases than anything. If we can make sure that these are people who are committed to the Constitution, who are committed to religious freedom. So we just felt really being pushed by God to do this. And I cannot tell you the attempts we got at us basically telling us, don't mess in our pool, don't come here, we could destroy you, all this kind of stuff. And I had people on my own staff telling me we shouldn't do this, etc. And finally, we just said, look, this is what God's called us to do. So if it destroys us, praise be to God. Because we're going to be obedient and let God take care of that. Well, the result was clearly God wanted us to do this. The first uh, seat opened, the Scalia seat. The first, you know, we thought everybody was doing the, the research, vetting every candidate. What we found, they weren't. 
we, we, here's this little group in Texas, and we we're doing heavy research on everybody. We found out, we'd go to the White House and we'd say, did you see that your number one choice had this opinion? And we'd watch their hair light on fire. That guy's gone. Number two, did you see this opinion by her? We watched her hairline on fire again. So we ended up having a huge impact on a lot of these judicial selections, especially a lot of the lower courts, making sure that they knew the information, that they picked really solid, high credential people who were committed. In fact, they picked very young people. So, and that began to make a huge difference. And this is how the future started to change. Um, and so examples of this, I think I've got a picture, yeah. Um, who is this guy on the left? Uh, he was top of his class. Uh, uh, from UT Law School, went to work at one of the biggest law firms in the country, uh, decided that he was ready to do something different, more significant, so he went out and worked in the U.S. Attorney's Office to put away terrorists. Mm -hmm. Won an award for putting away terrorists. And then the new Attorney General came in, pulled him off <laughs> some of that work to work on like LGBT issues and some other stuff, and he's like, you know, that's really not why I'm here, so, so he left. Where did he go? He came to work for First Liberty as one of our attorneys. And at age 38, he was tapped to be a federal judge for the rest of his life. Okay, here's a guy who's brilliant, who will never turn away from the Constitution, strong believer, he'll never have to worry about whether he's gonna do the right thing. And he's gonna be there maybe 40 years on the bench. That's changing the future, okay? Who's the guy swearing him in? Jim Ho, probably one of the smartest attorneys in the country. Probably will end up on the Supreme Court. Uh, he's now at the Federal Court of Appeals for the rest of his life. He was our most active volunteer attorney in the country. Okay, I mean, you start multiplying this times all the judges out there across the country and the quality of people that were put in, this changes the future. And the way it does in our arena is when you start putting all these originalists, with, originalists look to the original meaning of the text, whether it's the Constitution or uh, or a statute, you think, well, isn't that the way they always did it? No, they went by what they thought culture wanted. You know, it's an evolving document, the Constitution. We've got to reread it. Um, well, we've got a different set of judges and justices now who actually think their job is to follow the text, is to look to the original meaning. And what this does is it begins to change everything. So in the religious freedom arena, there are two religion clauses, the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause. They both have a horrible case that has been in place for decades, 150-something years, 135 years, that have caused great damage to religious freedom. Under the Establishment Clause is a case called Lemon, aptly named. Uh, under the uh, Free Exercise Clause, it's a case called Smith. And if you'd have asked me five years ago, can you get rid of those cases, I'd have said not in my lifetime. I said, we can pick away at them. We can, we can prove, but there's like, you know, 50 years of citing the Lemon case. Um, well, now I'm watching those cases be imploded. Why? Because when you begin changing the judges, you begin moving back to the founding principles, what the Constitution says, and it's changing the decisions. So first example of this is Coach Kennedy. Coach Kennedy is a, a Marine for 20 years and then came out and right before he goes to work his first day as a coach He makes a promise to God After every game When everybody goes to the center of the field they talk and slap each other on the rear end The first thing I'm going to do is go to a knee and thank you for the privilege of coaching these young men So for seven years he does that until somebody goes to the superintendent and says hey, it's really neat what your coach does What what is he doing? Next thing you know there's an investigation and Coach Kennedy is told, you can, if you go to a knee again, you're going to be fired. So what does he do? Well, he's a Marine. He's going he's to set a standard for those kids. He went to a knee, and they fired him. Now, unfortunately for Coach Kennedy, he lives in the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit is out of San Francisco, so not a safe place for him. The, co the, the decision out there said, coaches are not allowed to pray in public if anyone can see them. So this is, their, this is their version of the Constitution. Uh, we go to the Supreme Court. Uh, they didn't take the case the first time, but they sent it back down. They wanted some more facts. But the four more conservative justices, this is before Amy Coney Barrett was there, uh, said, go back down. But we find this decision below very troubling. Um, and then they said something totally out of left field. They said, by the way, we noticed that the first claim to reach us here is a free speech claim, not a free exercise of religion claim. 
Maybe that's because of the Smith decision that has caused so much damage to religious freedom over the last 30 years. But we haven't been asked to review that decision yet. Not subtle okay, from the Supreme Court. So everybody now realizes that we are maybe close to the process of blowing up this bad Smith decision and freeing up the free exercise protection for every American citizen. Same thing under the Establishment Clause. The Establishment Clause says Congress shall make no, uh, uh, Congress shall not, uh, make no establishment of religion. And, and what that means is it's talking about not having an established national church that we all have to support, and then it takes away from your freedom. Well, but 50 years ago, the liberal Warren Court said, no, no, it means more than that. It means no separate, it means separation of church and state. It means that you can sue if you're offended. You can't usually sue if you're offended. Only if you're offended by religion could you sue. So the last 50 years, we've all watched attacks on nativity scenes, menorahs, uh, a cross in public, a veterans memorial, all these things. The founders would be appalled. They would say, we didn't say this, but it's all because of this lemon case. And it created, it sort of made the government hostile to religion. Well, so we had this case, the Bladensburg Cross case. It's a memorial that was put up almost 100 years ago by moms who uh, lost their sons in World War I. And it sat there, it was American Legion land, uh, and then eventually it was outside of D.C., so the roads came around it, highways, and the government took over the land, but they didn't want to disturb the memorial, so they left it there. And then the American Humanist Association comes along and says, you can't have a cross on government property. And we go to the court of, uh, Federal Court of Appeals, and one of the judges says during the oral argument, why don't we just cut the arms off the cross? That way nobody will be offended and we won't have to tear it down. We think, I think we're going to have a problem with this court. So two to one, they said, after 100 years, this was now unconstitutional. So we went to the Supreme Court, but we looked up at the court. We saw that now Gorsuch was on the court. We saw that Kavanaugh was on the court. Kavanaugh donated time with us as a young attorney on religious freedom. He's been committed to religious freedom his, his whole life. Um, and we thought, you know what? We might can get rid of Lemon. Let's try so we didn't argue just to protect the memorial. We said, you don't need to follow Lemon. It's been such a disaster for 50 years. And the decision came down, 7-2, that memorial is still up. But 5-4, we're not following Lemon. So basically for 50 years, we've been going in this sort of hostility to religion direction as a country. We just turned, okay? If you look at the lower courts, they're all following this now. Hostility to religion is over. We're now not. Totally, and we still have to build this out, but I'm telling you, everything just shifted. And so if you look at what's happening under both religion clauses, in my opinion, every American is about to have more religious freedom than they've ever had in their lifetime. Uh, and it's kind of odd, you see all these horrible attacks in this darkness, but inside that, something incredible is happening in the religious liberty arena. So that's the really good news. Um, the bad news is, how, how would you stop it? How would that not happen? You'd have to have something really drastic happen, like court packing. Um, if you don't know what court packing is, court packing is when you add justices to the Supreme Court or the lower courts to just get the political results you want. It's a really horrible idea. They've done this. If you want to know what happened to Venezuela, court packing. How did it go from being a great country to just horrible now? Argentina, we can give you all kinds of countries uh, if you look at the history. The, the, the reason for that is that if you, really you don't have constitutional rights at the point you do this, okay? Because what this means is whatever your right is, if the majority party in power doesn't want you to have the right, they just add however many justices they need to take it away, okay? So I wanna show you just a one minute video to realize this is a real issue, and then I'll tell you the update from this little video. President Roosevelt clearly had the right to send to the United States Senate and the United States Congress a proposal to pack the court, but it was a bonehead idea. So no my opinion on court packing when the election is over. No, I know it's a great question. So I'll put together a national commission of scholars, and I will. Uh, Ask them to come back to me with recommendations as to how to uh, reform the court system. This is a live ball. Oh, it is a live ball. 
So we will figure out a way to get something done. Well, let's take a look and see. Everything is on the table. We're going to add five, six, seven, ten seats to the court. Well, I think everything's on the table. Everything is on the table. All of those matters will be on the table. All options are on the table. And as I said, everything, everything is on the table. Presidents come and go. Supreme Court justices stay for generations. So, what's happened? The president has issued an executive order creating a commission to reform the United States Supreme Court. That commission has been meeting. They're going to be coming with a recommendation in a little over a month. Um, a bill has been filed to add four justices to the Supreme Court. Another bill has been filed to add 203 lower court judges. This is court back, okay? And um, most of the country is against it, but if you look at it, 67% of the country is against it, but 63% of Democrats are in favor and they have the power. So we're doing everything we can to educate people. Uh, we've got a whole website, sort of a campaign headquarters for this whole effort around the country called Supreme Coup, C-O-U-P, if you don't know French, SupremeCoup.com. And we're going to do everything we can because this was attempted in 1936 and 37 with FDR. Um, and uh, uh, 80%, well, the Senate was 80 Democrats, 20 Republicans. Very popular president. But when the people understood what this was, they totally stopped FDR. His own senators turned against him. They said, this is tyranny. This brings tyranny, and they stopped it. So if people can understand what it is, I think enough people would rise up and we make sure this doesn't happen. But it's one of the few things I would say, if it were to happen, our country's over. You lose the rule of law, it's gone. The, the judiciary is pulled underneath the political branch and it's no longer independent. Uh, and so it's something we've got to fight. So that's the only thing I can see that could stop the direction we're going with our courts, which is really positive, and really positive with regard to the Constitution. So we're in a battle, but if any of you, by the way, and I'll just mention this, and then I want to end with one video and then we'll do Q&A. Um, on your table is a card. If you want to get our info, we won't ever give your info out to anybody. If you'll fill out the card before you go, we'll put you on our insiders list. So once a week you can see the cases, the things that are happening, the things you can pray for, the victories you can maybe tell other people so it'll embolden them that they have freedoms. because. It doesn't do us very much good if we're winning these cases, if nobody knows we're winning the cases, and they don't know these freedoms that they have. So we'd love for you to be involved. Uh, but I want to end with one of our more recent cases that I think is just such a great example. It's about a woman who slowly went blind, and as she was going blind, she realized the most important thing to her was to share about Jesus. Uh, until the, the park actually banned her for two years for talking about religion. So, hard, hard story to believe, but you got to see the story, and I want to give you the update. It's only a three-minute video. Nursing was it for me. It was my identity. I did everything. If I could help them get a job or an apartment, well, my husband says that I am a um, frustrated social worker. <laughs> January 7th, 1984. I actually had been going to a Bible study on the book of John, and uh, it opened my heart to the Word of God being the answer, the truth. It was the best day of my life. I actually was born with a genetic disorder, retinitis pigmentosa, and I still... I was over there. Oh, it went to a timeout on the computer. I can skip it if we need to, Steve. Just tell me. Huh? Yeah, all right. What, you'll hear, what you'd hear Gail say is that uh, as she went blind, this is the thing she was wondering, what am I supposed to do? I'm a nurse, I deal with people, I can't do that anymore. Um, and she realizes she's in a, an apartment across the street from the park. And so that's her assignment from God. And she goes across 
and every day she finds her way with her cane across the street. She gets to, she can't see people. As she says jokingly, I, I, can't, I can't run after people. It would be a tripping hazard for me. So, so she sits there until somebody comes by and she talks to them and she offers them a copy of the Gospel of John. And somebody at the park came and, uh, and complained and uh, eventually uh, the police came to her apartment and told her she was banned from the park and the public library for two years. Um, and she stood her ground and uh, it's kind of funny, she'd call us probably every two weeks. She ends, it's a very powerful video because at the end she says, this is what God's called me to do. I have to do it. And it's such a, a convicting thing for all of us when you look at what she's doing, right? You think, well, what, what ability does she have? And she, it's incredible what she's doing. But she would call us every couple of weeks and say, can I go to the park? And we'd say, look, look the lawsuits take a while. You know, this is going to take some time. And we'd get a call again, can I go to the park? And finally, I told our staff, I said, could you call Gail back and tell her that her story is getting out there and that you're going to create a lot more Gail Blairs all across the country. So God's using this for great things. It's okay. And they went and told her and I said, so what did she say? She said, yeah, yeah, I know that, but when can I go back to the park? <laughs> so uh, we ended up winning the case. Uh, we've had a couple of times now that Gail uh, has called us back to let us know that she's just uh, had a new person come to Christ uh, in the park. And, um, and the person who turned her in is now coming to her church. So I just look at Gail and I think, you know, what power does she have? But she was faithful. And uh, so that's kind of the question for us, right? I mean, I think what kind of future we're going to have as a country is kind of on the line right now. Whether our kids and our grandkids are going to have the freedoms that we had are going to be dependent upon whether we're faithful. Uh, I'm all in, and I hope you are too. Uh, and if so, we'd love to have you join us in any way to, to battle to make sure we have the same country, great country we had, that we want to pass down to our kids and our grandkids. So anyway, I want to let, uh, leave it open for questions or snide remarks or whatever you guys want to say. I'm happy to address if there's something you want to talk about. Like I know in, this real quick. I'm happy to answer questions. If you go to our website at firstliberty.org at the top, there's a deal that says Religious Liberty Protection Kits for vaccine mandates. There's, there's protection in every area, military, private employer, government employer that protects religious freedom and rights to request an exemption. All that's there in that kit if you need it or if you know somebody that's in a really tough situation. So just know about that. All right, questions? Yeah. Kelly, thanks so much for your work. Uh, I've enjoyed following you for years. Comment a little bit on the significance of Trump's role in appointing justices and the impact that's going to have. You know, Trump is a polarizing figure mm -hmm. among even conservative Christian people, and yet the significance of having him in office when those seats came available and his hard work and even sliding in any of the very what you know, a lasting significance. You said that's the turn. Uh, it's huge. Speech that said, yeah, the judges was something very unusual. We've never had a politician run for office and promise to do something fairly specific with regard to judges. Um, there was a, a, a meeting in New York that it was about a thousand evangelical leaders and pastors, all the made, you know, Franklin Graham, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and there were questions asked at that, some people, and I was allowed to ask him a question about judges. And I asked him, I said, look, I know you said you're going to pick people like Thomas and Scalia, but what about all the hundreds of lower court judges? How are you going to know who these people are, even if you want to fulfill your commitment? And that's when he said, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to like the Federal Society, the Heritage Foundation, the group like yours to make sure we get those kinds of judges. Obviously, Trump didn't sit and look at all the judges, okay? But he, he made a promise, and he, he gave that to the people to make sure it was followed through, and they did. They're very consistent in the type of judge. We've never really had that before. 
a lot of the judge picking is, well, you know, so-and-so is my brother and you need to put him in these seats. There's a lot of that that went on, a lot of politics. And it was really kind of, you know, removed in a major way. And they started picking quality, really quality people. Great credentials. I mean, even the liberals said these are the highest credentials that ever been chosen in these seats. Also the youngest ever. That was intentional. So the, is the youngest, if you look at all the appointments, the youngest average age ever because they're going to be there a long time. So this really changes the future. Now you could change this back over if another president with a very different philosophy had eight to 10 years, but it would take that long because again, there were 132 seats open, which is very unusual when he came in. So it, it, it's going to take a long time if somebody were to try to change what's going on. So this is going to really set us at least, I think, 20 years. And then depending on what happens in the future, maybe even much longer. But it's very different. We have here's the thing that people don't know. We have not had in 80 years, we had not had a majority of Supreme Court justices who thought their job was to look to the original meaning of the text. Now that sounds crazy, but that's the truth. This changes how they look at everything. And so they might they might disagree with how they interpret it, but it's a totally different approach and it changes what happens, and, and so it, it definitely takes us back to those core principles that are in the Constitution, in the statute, what the original meaning was, which I think gets back to our founding principles, and so, uh, so it's, a, it's a big deal, um, and certainly made a huge deal in our area. And again, we're just at the beginning of our, we're just starting to go back to, I think, some pretty powerful protections for people. Now, people as, uh, who are believers say, well, why is God doing this? Because God's clearly doing this. It, I couldn't, I've, I've been fighting this area for years. We've tried everything. This is a total move of God. Why is he doing it? I don't know. Is it because there's going to be a revival? Maybe. Is it because it's going to be so hostile that we're going to need the protection? Maybe. I don't know. I just know it's happening. And, uh, and it's going to be here for a while. It's going to make a big difference. Uh, so keep your eyes open. Be praying for the court, though. They, they're... One of the dangers of court packing is under FDR, they didn't get it through, but they so intimidated the justices that they changed their opinions for about 10 years. That very well could happen to our Supreme Court. They know that there's an attempt to court pack, which would destroy the court. They could easily start to lessen or move back on their decisions. I mean, they've got a big Second Amendment case right now. They've got a big abortion case right now. You know, is there a likelihood that one or two, will they modify what they would say about what the Constitution really says? I hope not, but there's going to be a real pressure to do that. So be praying for the court to be consistent with the Constitution and what they're supposed to do. Other questions? I'm happy to answer anything if you guys have anything. If not, uh, Kyle, or over here. If not, I'm happy to. Oh, is there somebody else? Right here. Uh, ah, okay, yeah. Okay. Well, and, and so as men, as we sit in here, and, and uh, very few of us are, will, will practice law even if we have a chance. <laughs> but You're wise. What, what do we do? We walk out of here, and it sounds good and everything. Good question. But as, as, as Christian men, what do we do that makes a difference? Yeah, good question. I'd say number one is prayer. Um, we have all these cases, like Gail Blair. She's all by herself, right? The people that we represent feel very isolated, oftentimes within their own church. Uh, people are uncomfortable with people that are causing a stir, right? They need prayer. They need prayer for their families. Um, number two, uh, as I mentioned, if we win but nobody knows, what have we done? So what everybody in here can do is they can be the Paul Revere of the people you know. Right? You can, if you were to get our email every week, number one, you might say, I really want to pray for that person or that case. Number two, maybe there's one of those that go, you know what, my friends need to know about this. Um, I didn't know the parents had these rights over their kids in the schools, or I didn't know we do any issue, right? If people are more emboldened, they're more willing to stand for their faith, they're more willing to speak for their faith. Uh, and so I would say those are two major things that people can do. The other thing is, I kind of mentioned it with Live Not By Lies, but we're in a time right now of 
Are we willing to speak the truth, even when it might cost us? Uh, the last chapter of Live Down My Lies is suffering as a Christian. Uh, and what he suggests is, number one, if you're really going to deal with this, you've got to teach your family truth. And number two, you've got to have a cell group larger than your family where you're strengthening one another to speak the truth, even if it costs you. That, we all need that. We all need that. And so we all need, you know, and we had a, uh, a book review of that. I was telling Kyle, my wife, I gave her the book, and afterwards she said, we've got to do a book review online of this. And I said, Karen, I'm traveling all over the country. I'm never home. The last thing I want to do is work at night. She kind of gave me the look. I said, okay, when do we start? <laughs> and uh, we did uh, six weeks, two chapters a night, only 11 chapters. We started with, I think, 20 or so couples. We ended up with 370 couples that were following at the end because people are hungry to know what is going on right now in my country and what do I do? And people were like, well, gosh, if I spoke for the truth every time I see a social media deal, I, I just, you know, I couldn't even live. I said, no, no, what we're saying is, you know, if you're never finding yourself speaking for the truth, you need to realize there's a problem. But what we need to do is listen to the Holy Spirit and realize he's calling us every once in a while to stand in the right way that he's asking us to stand. If we're not doing it at all in this culture, there's something wrong. Um, and so people, what we started watching is people starting to do things. Every once in a while, they would do things. We would see it on social media, we see it in other places, and they began to influence the people around it. And again, what happens is, a lot of other people believe the same thing. In fact, maybe most people a lot of times, but they need somebody else to stand up. And uh, we see it in our cases all the time. Something happens in a community, Everybody kind of sits around and wonders, and then one person steps forward. And when they do, everybody else steps with them. But they're waiting for the one person. And so in your situation, I'm sure there are going to be situations where if with God, you're the one person. Uh, and you're, you're needing to lead in that situation. And that's something you've got you to really be led by the Holy Spirit to do, when to do, when not to do. But we should all be doing that. So those are some basic, simple things. Praying for our cases, educating others so that they'll be more bold, and then speaking the truth uh, in the situation where God has you. Anything else? Yeah? My question is about abortion. Um, maybe not about abortion specifically, but about, really about incrementalism, the idea of chipping away at something versus the kind of going for the gender. What, what is your opinion about that methodology? Um, well, there's you know there's different justices that have different approaches. Obviously, you got they got this big abortion case. I'm concerned about the court packing pressure and all that. And what, if you saw what happened as soon as the Texas case was denied by the Supreme Court, in other words, they didn't take an emergency motion to stop the Texas abortion law. There was a if you watched, there was a massive number of Democrats who came up and said, "We've got a court pack. We've got a court pack." So uh, they realize it's a danger, and I'm. I'm hoping that it won't, but I think the theory is that there are some on the Supreme Court that would want to moderate how quickly they go in light of that. They shouldn't. That's not their job to listen to politics. They should do. They should follow the original meaning. Um, so, so that's going to be an issue. Now, Justice Kavanaugh is what people would call a conservative. The other way to word for it would be a minimalist, and that is. If you, as a conservative judge, if you only have to go this far to issue the opinion, then you don't go here. And sometimes conservatives get frustrated with the conservative judges because they don't go here when they only have to go here to rule on the case. And, uh, and so sometimes you're dealing with somebody or maybe you're frustrated because they're conservative. Uh, you know, their job is not to be an activist and not to be a politician. Their job is to decide the case before. So, so you got to look at each case and what it means, but really, I mean, what you should do is what the law says, what the original meaning is. Now, in the case of abortion, I think it should be fairly easy, which is read the Constitution all you want. There's nothing about a right to abortion in the Constitution. And everybody who's honest knows that. Um, but whether you, now you've got all this precedent for all this year of the stuff that they made up, um, how long is it going to take to unravel that? Uh, most people don't think that's going to happen in one fell swoop. They think they're going to knock a slat out one at a time. I think you've got probably three justices that would knock it out immediately. The question is how many more? Um, you got Gorsuch, you got uh, Alito, and you've got Thomas who most likely would say it's not in the Constitution, so case over. Um, whereas you've got others who are looking at 
precedent, stare decisis, and all this, and they're struggling with you know what to do or how quickly to go. Um, it, it's it's. I think the conservative approach is go by the Constitution. Um, but you know you you, uh, you know you've just got different philosophies all making up that court right now. The good news is I think the direction is the right direction. It's an originalism. It's a look to the text. So we're going that way. I think a lot of people are frustrated with the court right now because they feel like they put these more conservative justices on there and they're not doing what they want them to do. And that, I understand that, but it's not that they're doing wrong things. They're just not going as fast as people want them to go. And I think there's a difference, right? I mean, I kind of feel like there's the continental divide and if the water's over here, if it moves over here, it doesn't look like a big move, but that water is going to a very different place. And I think that's what's happened. We've moved. It may not look real drastic, but it's slowly but surely going to get to back to the sort of, you know, the more proper judging and the more proper interpretation of the Constitution. We had a time. You, you pulling the hook on me yet? I'm ready when you are. I'm up to you guys on whether you have another question. I don't want to keep anybody from work. But thank you all for letting me be with you. Thank you for uh, for being in Midland. I mean, it's just a wonderful place. I appreciate this place uh, and, and know that a lot of you are here for because of the families, the, the unique community it's in. And uh, uh, just hope you all can make a difference and maybe create some more Midlands across the country. We could sure, sure use that in New York and L.A. and a lot of other places around the country. But if we can ever help you, let us know. And uh, we'd love for you to be a part of everything we're doing. God bless you. Thank you.